Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to the Crawford School of Public Policy. We have an important event this evening that you know about. It's about food. It's about what's happening in the future. And we have some very well-qualified individuals uh, here in the front to, to, to lead us through their insights over the next few decades. And even more importantly, we have a particular uh, individual who's uh, well known to people in Canberra, uh, Lish uh, Freya, who will be the moderator for this evening. We have only a relatively short period of time. We'll commence, um, we already have, and finish at uh, quarter to seven. Uh, so my name is Quentin Grafton, and I have the pleasure of opening the uh, event this evening. I also talk very briefly at the very end uh, about some of my own work in the context of food and where we're heading in the next few decades. But first, let me acknowledge the uh, first Australians on whose land or traditional lands that we meet and pay our respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people past and present. So this event is uh, being staged by uh, policyforum.net, by various people at the ANU in terms of the activities that, that are done here. One particular center I'd like to highlight is the ARC Center of Excellence for Translational Photosynthesis, a world-leading center that is main aim to, provide, uh, to improve the biological processes of photosynthesis, to increase the yield of important food crops to address global food shortages in a changing world climate. We'll hear a lot more about that from uh, John and, and, and Andy and others. So this centre is a collaboration between six universities, six organisations, the ANU, University of Queensland, University of Sydney, uh, West, University of Western Sydney, Erie, uh, and uh, CSIRO. The other organizing entity for this evening's event is policyforum.net. It's a Crawford School uh, uh, activity. It's been in place for two years and six months or so, and just achieved its uh, 1,000th post uh, just uh, last week. It's reached out to more than 10 million people. I don't know what the, the number of reads are at the moment, but it's, uh, it's well over 10, 10 million people. And it uh, provides articles on a whole range of issues, including food uh, issues, but a whole range of public policy issues, not just here in Australia, but it has very much an Asian Pacific focus and indeed a, a global focus. It's featured uh, um, uh, blogs, uh, I should say, opinion pieces by some very notable Australians, such as the former uh, Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser and former head uh, uh, court, High Court Judge uh, Michael Kirby, among others. Uh, so that's by way of introduction. Um, what will happen this evening is uh, we, I will now pass on to our moderator, Lish, who will uh, provide the introductions to the speakers and make sure that we keep to time. <laughs> and there will be an opportunity for you, the audience, to very much engage in the question and answers uh, uh, later in the evening to, to engage with the presenters and ask them the sort of questions that you might, might be holding back. Okay, so over to you, please, Lish. Thank you, Quentin. Thanks, everyone, for turning out tonight. It's fabulous and happy Worldwide Fascination of Plants Day. I love that there is a Worldwide Fascination of Plants Day. Did you know today is the day? <laughs> this is the only event, event in Australia celebrating <laughs> Worldwide Fascination of Plants Day, which is excellent. Um, uh, what a way to appreciate plants by talking about how we're going to feed the world. Because at about 5.35, as it is now, we're probably thinking what we're going to have for dinner tonight. And most of us won't struggle to put a meal on the table. Pretty much. We'll, we'll be okay for both quantity of food and quality of food. And we would, I guarantee, probably be able to afford something. Not so maybe for the seven billion people out there that mightn't have so much to eat. So I was thinking tonight, I hate to bring a bit of my lapsed Catholic into this, but I was thinking of the miracle of the loaves and fishes and the feeding of the 5,000. And I don't think Jesus had any sort of peer review of that miracle. I'm not sure. But thinking of that, I think the task at hand for scientists and policy makers and the, the whole worldwide operation of feeding not just 5,000 but 9 billion by 2050 is enormous and it's going to require incredible collegiality, incredible minds and uh, so tonight I think this is a great way to start discussing it because 
how far are we away? 2017 now, by 2050, uh, there'll be another 2 billion people on this planet. So I'm going to introduce our first speaker for tonight. These guys suggest that they're just going to... I'd like to let them introduce themselves as a way of uh, giving you their background. And then we're going to put them up here on these high seats for a panel discussion. And then you're going to fire your questions at them. Um, if you don't have any questions, there's a plant in the audience. For, well, you don't appreciate that joke? That's a great joke for worldwide fascination of plants today. <laughs> So I think we'll get started. I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker. Thank you, John Evans, for laughing at my lame joke. Um, he's the a professor of here at ANU and with the ARC Centre of Excellence in Translational Photosynthesis. Oh, oh, in my in mine it's John, but it's John. Oh, it says Melissa in this other one. Oh well, we'll go to Melissa. <laughs> It depends on the slides. It depends on the slides. What's the first slide? Okay. Let's wait and see what the first slide is. <laughs> Introducing... It's me. Melissa! <laughs> Sorry. It's John. Exciting. Well, you can stand up here. I think that's a lovely idea. Great. <laughs> All right. So my challenge is in five minutes to try and introduce some topics that I wanted um, to, ra to raise in this forum. And um, I've just got two slides to sort of kick, kick the ball rolling. Um, first, I just wanted to introduce the concept of the Green Revolution. So I hope most of you are aware that in 1960, a guy called Norman Borlaug um, basically introduced dwarfing genes into wheat uh, at a place in, in Mexico, as well as um, some disease resistance genes. And by dropping the stature of the wheat crop, enabled uh, irrigation and fertiliser to be applied and dramatically increased the yield per unit of land area. And in the 60s, there was a very large amounts of, of, of people worldwide, particularly in Asia, who uh, were um, very insecure in their food supply. So over the subsequent 20 years, the adoption of this green revolution and um, introduction of these dwarf um, wheat and rice plants worldwide um, led to a dramatic increase in productivity and a huge number of um, people who previously um, were, were um, short on food now had available uh, food at a reasonable price. You can then see, so this graph on the top here is basically the three grasses, the cereals that dominate the production of food worldwide and supply the human diet. So they are wheat, rice and maize. And remarkably, the three of them, are, in terms of the global production, are remarkably similar to one another. Obviously, they produce uh, produced in different parts of the world. But you can see that from 19... Um, 80, then a plateau is reached. The graph there shows the global production per capita per year. So basically, you can see that on average, every person in the planet has available, at the farm gate at least, 100 kilograms per person per year of each of the three major cereals. Um, and then basically there's been a plateau since then. So a lot of the times people il illustrate the looming food security problem as the growing food population and the dramatic increases that need to be uh, obtained to maintain this. But what I take away from that is a really positive view that actually for the last 35 years or so, we've actually managed to keep food production in, in synchrony with the growth in human population. The third phase there you see is a little triangle with animal feed um, shown. So more recently, in the last couple of decades, human populations are becoming more affluent. And along with that is a change in our dietary preference. With more money, people like to have more meat in their diet. So in fact, an increasing proportion of some of our cereal production is going towards uh, feeding animals. Uh, if I can switch to the next slide. Um, so. Uh, with the, with the Green Revolution, basically what happened was the stature of the plants were, were, was shortened. That stopped plants falling over. And a, a larger fraction of the plant material, um, mass could be allocated to the grain. Um, now, plant breeders were very successful at shifting the plant's um, allocation between grain and straw, but that op opportunity and option is now fully exploited. And if we want to keep increasing yields, uh, we need to find a new an avenue. And one of the ways for doing that is to actually increase the biomass of the plant, the size of the plant. 
And photosynthesis is the first process in plant growth where the carbon dioxide is captured from the atmosphere and produces um, the plant material. So at our Centre of Excellence for Translational Photosynthesis, we're trying to identify targets which can be changed, modified, to improve the photosynthetic rate, and that will eventually translate into a larger plant and uh, an associated increase in the grain that that plant produces. Now, there are lots of ways that conventional plant breeding achieves continual gains in, in plant um, productivity. Uh, basically, in plant breeding, you need two components. You have to have genetic diversity, and then you select on a population of plants uh, to actually select the plant that has a, has a better phenotype. Um, so that's conventional breeding. Sometimes it's necessary to make really wide crosses to bring in new disease resistance. Uh, sometimes mutagenesis is used to create um, genetic diversity. But more recently, genetic engineering has become possible where we can actually take a gene from somewhere else or, or um, a, a relative plant and actually transfer it into the crop plant. And then the third, uh, the final one down there is uh, hybrid plants. Um, so what I would hope to get questions on tonight is about genetic modification and why it should be part of the suite of, of uh, options available for plant breeding because basically time is of the essence. We need to keep the pace of improving plants um, happening and this is a, a necessary part of our arsenal in, in order to achieve that. And there are some examples of which I can talk to. Thank you, John. Now, time is of the essence, so we'll move rapidly along. As you can see, there is so much wonderful information to be had here tonight, so we're just going to roll it along, keep your questions for the panel at the end. Our next speaker is Melissa Wood. She's the General Manager of, Glo and of Global Programs at the Australian Centre for International Agricultural, Agricultural Research. Please welcome Melissa. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and happy Plant Fascination Day. It's the first time I've ever said that. Um, this is a really big topic and I certainly don't have the answers. Um, but I do know that the current food system, systems just aren't fit for purpose and that we need some really big transformational shifts um, in the agri-food system to feed the 9.7 million by 2050. You'll no doubt hear a lot about the challenges over this afternoon, um, and I'll, I'll touch them on them in a minute, but the Minister for Agriculture in Kenya spoke to me last year, and he said all of these challenges are challenges that impact and affect agriculture, but not one of them are challenges that agriculture can face alone. This is something that we need multi-sectoral, interdisciplinary <coughs> approaches to them. The sort of challenges I'm talking about is meeting the nutrition needs of 9.7 billion people, 80% of who are going to live in the developing world, um, and by 2050, about the majority of them will be living in urban megacities. Resource constraints, and I know we're going to hear more about that this afternoon, climate change impacts, the impact of food loss and waste, which is about 30% of the food that we grow is wasted. And if food loss and waste was a country, it would be the third largest greenhouse emitter on the planet. Social and environmental sustainability and changing patterns of consumptions amongst a few. It is not as simple as increasing agricultural production. And it really, we need to build healthy and sustainable agri-food systems that are well connected to the global food systems through trade. Now above me are a group of smallholder farmers that ACR are currently working with. Um, and I put them up because I wanted to remind us that they represent 90% of the world's farmers, which is about half a billion farmers. The majority by far are smallholder farmers. And they supply the food of about 50 to 80% of what we eat on the planet. So they're really significant. They're very critical to everything we do when it comes to improving the food system, both in terms of ensuring the interventions and the technologies are relevant to him or her, and also to ensure that they're well supported and have the enabling environment, the right policies, etc., to be able to adopt, change their behaviour, and put these into place. They're a really big part of the solution. In spite of all these challenges, there's some good news out there. And one of the world's most optimistic and generous citizens um, is very good at reminding of us of this. And in fact, he's a major donor of an innovation I'll, I'll talk to you about in a minute. He claims 
to predict that in th uh, 2035 there'll be almost no countries, poor countries left on the planet. Um, and the International Institute of Sustainable Development and the World Food Policy Institute believe that we can end hunger by 2035 at a cost of about an additional $11 billion per year. Four billion are gonna come from the donors and the other seven billion from those poor countries and then you know we can tick that box. So I've decided to focus on a challenge that you may have heard about but perhaps not thought about and that's uh, n nutrition. The Global Hunger Index comes out every year and that talks about how we're doing globally in terms of nutrition. It's an index of a number of things like undernourishment and child stunting and wasting and it's showing that it's definitely falling. It's fallen by 29% since 2000. But it's really lumpy, and some regions of the world, like Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, are still doing very poorly at about um, indices of about 30 and 29, while generally, globally, it's down at uh, 21. And in our own region here in Southeast Asia, it's 12. But we can't talk about hungry people without um, talking about the impacts of not just poverty but prosperity. And we have to recognise that we're not just talking about the quantity of food but the quality of food. And that's what I want to talk to you about um, for the rest of this. You've probably heard about the nutrition uh, double, triple burden. So we've got one billion people who are undernourished and not getting sufficient calories to eat. We've got another two billion who are suffering from malnutrition from lack of micronutrients, so vitamin A, zinc or iron. And then we've got another two billion who are over-consuming and are obese and are at risk and probably suffering from non-communicable diseases like type 2 diabetes and coronary heart disease. Now this triple burden is really costing the planet a huge amount. Um, malnutrition costs about uh, economic losses of about 11% of GDP per year and we know that for every dollar we spend addressing malnutrition we're getting a $16 return. And many of the countries in our region are suffering from both under and over nutrition. For example, in the Solomon Islands, 33% of children are stunted, while 39% of women are obese. And in Indonesia, 39% of children are stunted and 12% of children are overweight. And currently India, and, and as I showed you, they're one of the highest global um, hunger index they're spending 25% of their current health budget on dealing with um, diabetes. So you can imagine what their future looks like. But there's some innovative work being done by a science team that ACR is supporting, as is Bill Gates, and I wanted to just share a little bit about that, and that's called biofortification. So that's the process of breeding nutrients into regular staple cereals like the ones that John showed us before. And it's really effective because it reaches the poorest of the poor in rural populations who can't afford diet, dietary diversity and to eat the fruit and vegetables that we would need to eat for, for nutrition purposes. This work's been getting quite a bit of attention. It actually won the World Food Prize last year. And this year it was one of the innovators in the launch food um, program that's being led by Nike and USAID and DFAT. So these crops, um, these crops are being bred through traditional and transgenic processes um, and they've proved to be a really successful way of having an impact on the nutrition and health. Now, as John said, the Green Revolution worked. We've increased our production of the staple food crops but we haven't increased our production of the nu nutrient-dense crops like fruit, vegetables and nuts. We've also found that food prices for those staple crops have decreased, which is great. They're much more accessible. But what we haven't got, we've got um, increasing high prices of the nutrient-dense food. So that means that um, while these nutrient-dense foods are important to eat, they're resulting in less and less portion of the food basket. While they may be providing 20% of what people are eating, they're costing 50% of the food budget. And that's, that's totally unsustainable. So can we have the next slide, please? So we need to maximise the supply of nutrients that are coming from agriculture, which is where, in Africa, two-thirds of the people 
gain their livelihood and, and nutrition from, and reduce the amount coming from supplementation and other really inaccessible and expensive ways of uh, providing nutrients. And biofortification can provide that. So to date, there's been 12 uh, crops released across 30 countries and another 30 countries um, are under testing. And to date, they've reached about 20 million people. And I'm talking about crops like rice, wheat, maize, pearl millet, sorghum, cassava, sweet potato, bananas, uh, cowpea, chickpea, and lentil. Um, and th the reason I really like this innovation is that it doesn't require farmers to change their behaviour. And those of us that work in trying to get adoption and scale out know how, how this is a holy grail. The farmers are growing the same crops they've always grown. They look the same, they taste the same, they cost the same. But they're getting the added benefit of the, of the nutrients by consuming them. So at the moment, there's a massive global push for mainstreaming. So you'll probably hear more about this. Um, but we know that by combining the micronutrient traits of really expensive foods into the cheaper, really accessible foods that the smallholder farmers eat, we're currently putting a solution into the hands of the farmers. And given how important they are for our food systems, that's a, cr a critical and transformative win-win. So I believe with the right partnerships, the right enabling environment, time, resources, commitment, we can have some other examples of these sort of transformative impacts. And I really think that biofortification of um, staple crops is a good model for us. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Our next speaker is Associate Professor Jamie Pittock from the Fenner School of ANU. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, one reason I'm fascinated with plants is that they transpire water. And water is particularly scarce in many regions of the world and getting scarcer. People already divert something uh, like half the accessible water resources around the world, and 70% of that goes into irrigated agriculture. Yet our climate is changing, and as the climate changes, so too will the availability uh, of water. One way of having more secure uh, food production uh, is to use irrigated agriculture, to disconnect, if you like, uh, the immediate local rainfall that's needed to grow plants uh, in dry land agriculture and instead have water stored and delivered on demand uh, to irrigate crops. So one way uh, looking forward to increase the security of our food supply is to irrigate more crops. Under the best scenario, something like 70 to 90% more water would need to be consumed to grow the food uh, to feed uh, a population of 9.7 billion people at the mid part of this century. So uh, this intensification push sounds like a good way to go, uh, perhaps using the same area of land, uh, a modest area of water to grow much more food. And uh, in Africa, uh, where I and my colleagues are working, uh, the governments have some very, very ambitious plans to expand irrigated agriculture. Uh, in Africa, uh, the Australian uh, Centre for International Agricultural Research has been funding uh, a, a program that I've been leading, looking to see how we can uh, improve the productivity of water use in agriculture to supply food more reliably. But I'm sad to say that the situation is pretty grim. Uh, Africa is the region of the world that is least food secure. Something like 30% uh, of the population of Africa uh, are food insecure. And Africa is also the region of the world where the population is growing most quickly. It is the crucible where uh, food security, uh, if we are to succeed, uh, will, uh, will need, to, uh, need to occur. Irrigated agriculture requires infrastructure. That infrastructure is very, very expensive. It's very expensive to build and very expensive to maintain. 
of the 7 million hectares of irrigated land in Africa, something like 2 million hectares are abandoned. Of the remaining 5 million hectares, the current productivity uh, per hectare is extremely low, often as much as one-tenth of good practice of Green Revolution technologies. So the Green Revolution has really passed Africa by. You know, we've got the engineering to build good irrigation schemes. We've got access to good seeds. We know how to use fertilizers to grow very good plants. But in places like uh, Silat Lachani, where we're undertaking research in Zimbabwe, none of those things uh, are happening. So at Silat Lachani, uh, it is a government-owned scheme. Uh, and the cropping schedule has been painted on the wall of the irrigation office here since the scheme was built in the late 1960s. And every year the government extension staff have come along and said to the farmers, you're stupid, you're lazy, you're not doing all the right technical things to do to grow more food. But when we actually talk to the farmers, the farmers are very, very logical. The farmers are being rightly risk averse because their water supply gets cut off. So they're opting for low input, low output farming systems. They're only producing a tonne of maize a hectare when they could be producing eight, nine, 10, 12. And so the question is why? Is it because they don't have the right technology? Uh, I would argue no. The reason is that the societal rules to support agriculture are broken, and they're broken at every step in these irrigation schemes. The farmers don't have an entitlement to land, so they can't borrow money to buy improved seeds or fertiliser to grow a good crop. The governments haven't sorted out who owns which bit of infrastructure. And so the canals between the dam and the fields are not owned by anybody, and when they break down, nobody repairs them. Because the farmers are told by the governments to grow cheap, uh, unprofitable crops like maize, they don't actually make enough money to pay the fees needed to maintain the irrigation infrastructure. So the question is, how can we turn that sort of thing around? What we've been trying to do in the project that uh, uh, ACR has been supporting us to do is to come up with some quick, simple wins. And this is a picture of one of those using a simple tool to measure uh, the right amount of water and the right amount of fertiliser in the field. The farmers have never had this before. They've never known exactly when their crops need a bit more water. Most of these fields were drowning. They were putting on water whenever they had it and the crops were drowning. So when the farmers have had this quick win, they've doubled and tripled yields in the last three years in these plots, they've then become open uh, to working together collaboratively to solve some of the rules, to work out who owns which bit of equipment and who's going to maintain it, to work out whether they can buy uh, improved seeds and fertilisers together at lower cost, to actually talk to the people who buy their food and ask them what quality of food do they want and when do they want it so that they can maximise the income that they get uh, in return. And so I would argue that while many of the new technologies may help, they will not help in Africa, they will not help the poorest of the poor, unless we support these smallholder farmers, improve the governance that they need to grow food uh, for uh, the coming billions. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Our next speaker, Professor, oh, Associate Professor Andy Morell, he's from the University of Queensland and also from the Centre of Excellence for Translational Photosynthesis. Well, good evening. I have been working a bit uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa as well on projects funded by Norman the Gates Foundation and ACR, and also in uh, Central Western India on a project funded by ACR and looking at drought adaptation and crops there, and some work too in, in Vietnam funded by the government of Norway and Vietnam Academy of Ag Science. So I thought this evening I'd get us thinking by presenting five steps uh, that could help to solve the world's food dilemma. And these ideas are a combination of many people's thinking. And the first one is we need to reduce agriculture's footprint. 
So farming of both livestock and crops is the largest human endeavour on earth and it uses more than 38% of ice-free land. So it's a big area. We've already cleared an area uh, roughly the size of South America for cropping and to raise livestock we've taken over even more land, an area roughly the size of Africa. So there will remain some opportunities to further expand agriculture's footprint, particularly in Africa, but our main aim should not necessarily be further expansion of agricultural land. We need to grow more on existing farms and we'll need to increase food production per unit of land area. We can now focus on increasing yields on less productive farmlands in areas like Africa, Latin America, Eastern Europe, where there are yield gaps. So this is differences between current production and what potential production could be. We need to use resources more efficiently as well, things like water, nutrients, energy. And commercial farming has started to make huge strides in this area. And you think about computerised tractors, advanced sensors, GPS systems, and sustainable farming systems can also greatly reduce uh, the use of water and chemicals by incorporating cover crops and mulches and compost, and this can improve soil quality and conserve water and also build up nutrients. We need to shift our diets. It would be far easier to feed 9.7 billion people by 2050 if more of the crops that we grew ended up in human stomachs. And today only 55% of the world's crop calories feed people directly. So feeding grain to livestock is not very efficient. For example, it takes 25 kilograms of feed to produce one kilogram of beef, but just two kilograms to get one kilogram of insects like crickets. So maybe we'll really have to think about what we eat. Then there's reducing waste. Around one third of our, our food is wasted. And in rich countries, a lot of the waste happens in homes and supermarkets, uh, restaurants. And in poor countries, it's often lost on the farm or on the way uh, to a marketplace. So there's a lot that can be done there. And of all the options for, boost, for boosting food availability, tackling waste would be one of the most effective, I believe. Now, the, the next slide I've got just raises a couple of other issues. And some of these other issues include genetic and management solutions. So if you're improving crops, then genetic solutions, you can use genetics to decrease water demand, to increase water supply, to increase the water use efficiency of crops. And then there's management solutions, and there's plenty of those as well. Things like managing soil water, sowing dates, plant populations, fertilizer rates, irrigation, cropping systems. And then the real power here comes from the interaction between these genetic and the management solutions. And for example, consider if you were growing a drought adapted variety of rice under aerobic conditions in a water limited environment. It's a very powerful combination. We need greater synergy in crop research. We need a transnational approach. We need to identify productive synergies by integrating islands of knowledge. And we need integrators. These are people who can manage multidisciplinary projects at the global level. We need to recognise the value of teams and we need to understand that impact is important. We need some revolutionary strategies as well. Smartphones are revolutionising farming in, in Africa and Asia. Vertical farming is another idea in cities where yields can be 130 times those in an equivalent area of arable land. We need a fundamental rethink of what we eat so perhaps we need to eat more algae like seaweed and more insects. And we need to reconsider biotechnologies. What about climate change and food security? Overall CO2 trends will likely increase global yields by roughly 1.8% per decade over the next few decades. But over the same time period, warming trends are likely to reduce global yields by roughly 1.5% per decade in the absence of adaptation measures. And it's plausible that this reduction in global yields could range from 0% up to 4%. Finishing off, I'm making the statement that yes, we can. So my opinion is that we can put food on the plate of 9.7 billion people. 
I think the solutions are there. And simultaneously, we could take action on four key themes. One, reduce food waste. Two, reduce the yield gap. Three, change our diets. And four, address climate change. They're four key things we could look at, but we need to take the actions now. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Oh, it's lovely to hear that optimistic view and the, the positivity. Our final speaker for this evening, before we get onto our panel discussion, is Professor Quentin Grafton from here at the Crawford School. So the first one. So thank you so much for moderating for us, Lesh. Um, look, I'm going to try and uh, give you a perspective that's quite similar and complementary to the other four speakers. So the number of things I want to say, so the first thing I want to do is not this figure, the previous figure, please. So the previous figure is this one here. So it, it illustrates what I will call knife edge situations. A knife edge situation is, you know, well, it's a knife edge. You can go on one side of that knife edge and things are fine, okay? Or you can go on the other side of a knife edge and things get pretty rough for you. And what I'm presenting here is, can, in some sense, supports a number of the things that have already been said. So there are two sets of projections, okay? So the first set of projections as, as here looks at population increases, looks at calorie projections per person, etc., out to 2050. And it looks at the production in the 19 largest food producing countries in the world. It doesn't take all the countries in the world, it takes the biggest countries in the world in terms of their food production. That's over 80% of the world's calories are produced in those 19 countries. And we project this out in terms of what's available, the modeling that we've done, and you can see a decline in the relative surplus, of, and we started in 2010, a decline in the relative surplus associated with those 19 countries and the ability to feed the world. And so that's not a good trend, okay? But it depends how bad this gets, okay? So these assume here, okay, this orange, and the, the, here assumes a 1% increase in crop yield improvements, which is a little less than what we currently have in crop yield improvements. So it just highlights the points that John and Andy made and others made in the context of the absolute importance to improve crop yield increases on an annual basis, not just this year, not just for next year, for decades to come. So that's the first thing it emphasizes. Second thing it emphasizes, because you can see that if we don't have at least 1% increase, we get into this negative territory. Second thing it emphasizes is that even with the increases in those 19 large food producing countries, we're still going backwards in the, in the global context. And the reason we're going backwards is what Jamie emphasized in terms of the population increases going on in Africa right now and in the decades to come. So it basically tells us that the crop yield increases will not only happen in these 19 large countries in terms of food production, Australia is one of them, it must also happen in Africa. There must be a, a green revolution in Africa of comparable magnitude to what we've seen in the past, in the past few decades, particularly in, in Asia. If we don't get that, we're also in trouble. And also highlights the points that was raised in, in the context of diets so, and, and income increases. So part of the reason that we're going to be consuming more food is not because there's not going to be more people. There'll be 2.4 billion more people by 2050. But we're also going to be wealthier. We're going to be more urbanized. Our diets are going to change, and we're going to eat more. So that if you're not very uh, wealthy and you get more income, you tend to spend a lot more on your food. And that trend and that increase has been projected out by others. And this is a, a scenario that we can project out. So what it basically says is that things could be OK, <laughs> or it could be really bad. I don't know what the future holds for us, OK? This is not a doom and gloom scenario. It's, it's a scenario which says we've got to do something now, 2017, and then the years to come. That's what the ARC Center of Excellence for Translational and Photosynthesis is trying to do. It's part, part of the solution that we're, that we're looking at. Now, one of the things that uh, Jamie emphasized was the issues of water, and I'll just highlight the issues of water. So Jamie uh, told us then, and it's correct, that about 70% of the world's water that's extracted is used for agriculture. A much higher, higher proportion is used in terms of water consumption. So 80 to 90% of the water that's actually consumed is actually consumed in agriculture. So in other words, you can't talk about food production and agriculture if you don't talk about water. So this 
Next figure, please. Give some highlights. And this actually is a conservative projection out to 2015. It assumes a 1% increase in crop yield improvements, and it assumes 200 kilograms per hectare of nitrogen. So it's a fairly, fairly optimistic scenario, or a reasonable scenario. It's certainly not a doom and gloom scenario. And what it shows you is that there are water surplus countries and water deficit countries in terms of their projected water use, and there are food deficit and food surplus countries. A lot of effort has been focused in on showing that there are countries that will have substantial food surpluses. So these are all these countries over here on the right-hand side of the zero, all food surpluses, which is fine if you only think about food, but if you don't think about the resources required to produce the food, and it's more than just land and labor, it of course includes water. So what we see here in these countries is that yes, they could produce enough food if we ignored the water constraints. If we include the water constraints, they've got problems. And the only way they can meet those problems is by increasing their water supply in terms of water investments, water infrastructure, etc., or importing more food. And then you have these countries up here which have you know, the, uh, the, the water surpluses, but even then that's highly conservative. You look at India's case, so India seems to show a water surplus. It's simply because we've only looked at irrigation water demand. India's growing at approximately 7% a year, <laughs> yeah. massive growth uh, uh, rate. And what that means is that there's huge demand increases over the coming decades in industrial uses as well as residential uses of water. Although they won't necessarily to higher rates of consumption of the way it would in agriculture, that means that India also has a substantial problem. So in other words, how do we put this together? And this gets to Melissa's point. So Melissa talked about integrative approaches, and as did Jamie and the others, institutional approaches. We can't just separate food and water, we have to put them together. And what are the solutions? Well, there are multiple solutions, okay? <laughs> okay. Uh, there's no one single approach. One of them, of course, is to maintain or increase those crop yield improvements, absolutely critically important. That's the food supply context. The other one is the productivity context, sustainable increases in total factor productivity. In other words, getting more crop without necessarily, in fact, without using more inputs. And that was uh, alerted to us by Andy in the context of precision agriculture and in terms of using some of the technologies that Melissa emphasized. That is a real possibility, but it'll take time to take those sorts of things out. Institutional, integrative policies. Melissa emphasized it's not just about agriculture, it's about a whole bunch of other stuff coming together. Okay, the R&D, it's not just in the private sector, it has to be R&D in the public sector. Is those, are those investments being made? Then there's the issue of water supply infrastructure. Okay, so there are additional water storages that could be grown, but there are consequences associated with that, especially for those countries that are close um, or relatively close to their overall water resource. And those countries are the ones with the big circles. And as you start to use, so take India for example, it uses about half its available water resource. There's no more water available for India than its water resource. There is no more additional water and it's using about half of it at the moment. So once you get into that sort of territory, it becomes much more difficult to increase your water supplies in terms of your water storages without having a whole range of negative implications for the environment and particularly for the poor. And so, um, and the last thing I would talk about is the issue about using crops to be able to grow more crop for the actual drop that's allocated to the plant. And that, there are some potential gains there, not huge gains, but there are some potential gains there as well, again, with the sorts of work that, uh, that others, including at the ARC Center for Translational uh, Photosynthesis, are doing. So those are, are possible ways forward. We can do this, absolutely we can do this, but we should not be complacent about it. We need to think about not, in the con not only in the context of what we're doing in Australia, but what we're happening overseas. It's a global problem, it'll be a global issue, and it will require global cooperation. Thank you. I'd like to invite our speakers up to the high chairs for the, the panel discussion. And we'll go around the room. I think we've got some a microphone, roving microphone, have we? Yeah. Yeah, great. Um, I'll, I might, will I go around with the microphone? 
So if you'd like to ask a question, just raise your hand and the microphone will miraculously come to you. Okay, we might we might get started. Thank you all um, for your wonderful rapid fire of like I felt like a bit like Shark Tank having to do the pitch uh, to a, a, a very um, welcome audience. Let's start with the first question for a hello. Um, greetings, hi, uh, Ms. Henry and you. Um, a question for the entire panel. We've heard, thank you, wonderful presentations. Um, and a lot of the focus has been increasing the all the things that need doing, but often on the increase in product um, production. Uh, my question, and I'd like all of you to have a bash at perhaps, is is the equity thing. You know, this just, we know the food waste, but what systems might be a better way of actually increasing the availability um, and and sort of you know it's because it's the distribution pathways and and such and, and just on that I remember in about the early 80s uh, traveling through Egypt and every time I met anyone they said oh Australia oh thank you thank you for our bread on every pa uh, you know bag of flour was gift from the Australian you know gift from Australia um, and I don't know whether we still do those sort of things but anyway just tying in those who would love to start Great question, Liz. Uh, my concern is that a lot of the debate about food security is focused on calories. And to pick up on Melissa's point, uh, nutrition is really a huge concern. And so in many of the places where our research team is working in Africa, in Mozambique, in Tanzania and in uh, Zimbabwe, the focus on calories means that uh, there isn't locally available uh, the sorts of foods that will lead to good outcomes like avoiding childhood stunting. Uh, and so uh, I greatly appreciate the work on getting good volumes of these crops that can provide calories, but we must also have a more diverse diet in many of these places. Many of these more remote places, you're talking about equity, it's the poorest of the poor. They're not connected to even the national economic system very well, let alone the international one. Uh, and so working on those local economies to get the distribution and the diversity of food sources, I think, is really important for health. Uh, well, I think, okay, I think in terms of equity, uh, I just came across a very interesting article on my way back from Europe um, with uh, the subsidisation of, of bread in Egypt. Now, the Arab Spring, to a large extent, was uh, associated with social unrest and, and inability to, to feed with, with um, social problems. Um, and one of the things that the Egyptian government does is subsidise bread for, for poor people in the idea of actually going to provide food for those um, least able to, to um, afford it. Unfortunately, quite a lot of that then gets diverted as very cheap uh, food supply to feed animals. Um, so how you actually achieve equity in, in an efficient way is, is, is a challenge. But uh, in terms of aid, often um, it's now recognised that actually giving poor people or, or people in need of aid money is the best way and let them make the decision of what they want, what they want to purchase. Thank you, um, Great question. And um, equity and income equality in particular is one of the big issues facing all of us. And a lot of what we're seeing is the result of that. And it's something that the G20 is really taking seriously and looking at. So um, what we do tends to be much more on the ground, but of course it's sort of going to all scale up. And a good example is 
where we work with women and women's crops, so we're really poor people, child care households. Um, and we've got a project that's been so successful in East Africa that looked at removing um, Newcastle disease from chickens, eradicating that, which meant that they survived and they could grow their, their, their flocks, which meant they could sell them. And some of the villages we went to, for the first time, these women were able to trade six chickens for a goat. And previously, they'd never owned anything. But because it was their work that had resulted in these flocks, they were able to keep that asset. And slowly, slowly, they were growing, growing their assets, and they had a greater decision-making power in their households, and they were spending some of the So it was a really positive outcome. And I remember talking to one of the men in the village and asked him why, why this was. And he said, this has been a fundamental shift in, the, in our culture because normally if I'd gone in and given a go to that village, there's no way that woman would have been allowed to protect it. So that's a little example of how equity is changing. And when it comes to aid, we certainly move beyond the view of giving gifts. What we do is form partnerships. We try really hard to work with the people in the country. As Jamie said, they pretty well know what's going on, but they need a little bit of help to interpret it or make it happen. And that's where we help with technical assistance and capacity development. Mm -hmm. Hi, Justin Borvitz. A question for Jamie or Quentin about water underlying agriculture, and what about desalinization? What's going to come in the future? Okay, a real, really good question, Justin. So it's really a cost of energy associated with desal, and uh, if you look at the, um, the a lot of the costs go down, depends where you are. Those costs are still very, very high for agricultural purposes. So desal works well for um, you know, relatively wealthy individuals or high income, like in Australia, uh, located on coastal city locations. <coughs> if you're talking about desalination for irrigation purposes, you know, typically you won't be necessarily out there right at, uh, at sea, or sea level, or right at the coast. So you've got to transport that water as well as desalinate that water. And when you start to talk about those costs, it's really not a viable proposition unless we were to get some very, very cheap uh, energy to, to do that. So it's, um, it's not a, that's not to say that desal can't happen, feasible, it is feasible, but in terms of what's, what's possible, in terms of you know, the economic side, in terms of how it would work, um, I don't see it as a, uh, as, a, as a breakthrough, circuit breaker in the context of the, the water constraints. Thanks. All right. All right. Uh, so, in the Western world, GMOs have many stigmas, both uh, positive and negative. In uh, these African countries where you guys are doing most of your, your research, uh, do, are there any stigmas associated with GMOs, or do you talk about them, or is that just not discussed at all? The farmers we're working with are so poor that they often can't buy seeds, so they're keeping their local varieties, which aren't particularly productive in terms of yield, uh, or uh, they're only able to afford to buy the most bog standard seeds, and often their problem is that they're buying small quantities of seed from local shops that are counterfeit. Uh, so they're not even at the at sort of step one on the green revolution, as it were, of being able to afford to buy uh, well-bred plant seeds, except in some of the schemes that we've been able to intervene and help them get that access. Yeah, we talk uh, about a, a range of technologies, and it's finding the appropriate technologies. So in countries like Ethiopia, where we've been doing the project with the Gates Foundation and with ACR, it's a matter of, of working with their local crop improvement program and trying to find out what are the best technologies. So you, you might pick some, uh, some simple things about increasing the rate of genetic gain or about um, the, the use of, of some uh, simple digital technology, but ways that you can make a, a real difference. So yes, there, there can be a place for the, the GM technologies, uh, but it's about uh, where it's appropriate 
And also, when you're introducing a new technology, it's very different when you're introducing a new technology in Africa compared to when you might be introducing that technology in Australia. So you need to understand all of the challenges about doing that in a developing context. I'm interested, Jamie, just on, uh, further to that question, is why, what's the barrier apart from cost? Why, how are they going to get the seed? Would they need, if we're doing all this research into improved yields and drought resistance, if they can't get the seed, how are we going to address the problem? It comes back to a whole bunch of basic governance questions. So the African governments need to adopt the laws to enable high quality seeds to be traded across borders cheaply. There's a lot of regulatory barriers to them getting the stuff into the country. That's one thing. Another thing is that because the farmers don't have an entitlement to the land, they can't go to a microfinance lender and borrow enough money to buy the seeds they need to plant their year's crop. So they can't afford to go to your local Monsanto office or Dow office and even buy the 100 kilo sack of improved seed. Uh, they're just not at that level. <coughs> This Jen here? Oh, and, uh, yeah, we'll just go to the slide back and then you, sir. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Pushpa. I am a Crawford uh, PhD student over here. Uh, basically, my question is actually there is this discussion that even today there is enough food around the world for everyone and still people are going hungry. So when you're talking about feeding 9.7 billion people by 2050 and talking about increasing yield uh, and production, how do we ensure that the situation at that time will still not be the same that is today, having enough food but not everyone having enough uh, to eat? Uh, because uh, I think one uh, way of discussing this is there is one argument which says that why we have raised today where we are is uh, we abandoned uh, traditional agriculture. We focused more on bigger farmers, on the Green Revolution. Even in India, if we see it, uh, the Green Revolution actually it uh, was beneficial to the larger farmers and not to the smaller ones. And therefore, when we're talking about having an overhaul of the food system today, uh, there is a discussion saying that we have to go back to the roots. Because when we talk about like biofortification bio of uh, food and then bringing up with new varieties. It's, uh, I think, a very new uh, and a very important, a very useful way of uh, thinking about things. But when we talk about these new varieties and the intellectual property rights that will be associated with these new varieties, a, a thing that has not been discussed over here now, and then the high cost of the varieties, which are owned by like multinational seed companies, how are we going to ensure that these are the varieties that these poor farmers will have access to, and then we can get rid of the problems that we're discussing today? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, one thing is that, that I think we need to work with the national programs within countries. And it, it's about listening. It's about going in, and whether it's with Ethiopia or with Indonesia or Vietnam or India, that I mean, very much is a, about a partnership. And I think about going in and, and listening to what the needs are and then uh, troubleshooting around that. But I think it's that one of the keys, I believe, is working with the national programs in crop improvement. And you can work with genetics, you can work with management, you can work with a combination of both. Uh, but I think that's uh, where some, some real progress can be made. So that, uh, over time, that national program really develops to a stage where they are able to uh, address the issues uh, of food security. And of course, good governance is required to do that. Great. The most heartbreaking thing I've seen in Africa is travelling along highways in Tanzania and seeing women sitting beside huge baskets of tomatoes that are rotting. And that's where there's this example of a vast amount of waste. And when we've gone to the irrigation schemes and spoken to the farmers, uh, by and large they've never had the resources to go to the nearest provincial city market and see what is being bought and sold and actually ask the buyers what is the quality of fruit that they want and what time of year they want it. And so they're all growing tomatoes that ripen in the same few weeks, the same few months. And so they go from nothing to a glut 
uh, and there's this massive wastage and they get low prices. So I'm not at the point of saying that we need vast new technology to fix that. I think what we need to do is engage with those communities and help them do basic things like uh, gross margin analysis calculations on growing the crop, visiting a market and working out what will sell and get a decent price and win, asking the buyers what's the quality of stuff they'll actually pay for. And those simple techniques can dramatically improve uh, incomes as we're finding in some of the irrigation schemes we're working on. Yeah, I, I totally support that. I don't believe it's about technology. I think there's probably enough out there. What, what we find in Africa is we've got a lot of um, international centres like the CDAR producing palliative varieties and they're not being adopted in Africa the way they are in other countries. So in other countries, they're up at about 80% adoption rates. In Africa, it's 30%. And, that's be, and we've got a project looking at that. And that's because the scientists are breeding for traits that they think that the farmers need. And in fact, they should be breeding for traits that the farmers and the consumers are demanding. So what we've done is we're working with uh, the Syngenta company to understand um, what they use in this demand-led plant breeding. So if a, if a company doesn't produce seeds that people want to buy, they go broke. So we're applying the same principles with the national breeding programs throughout Africa and developing some breeding training protocols that are going into the university curriculum so that the next generation of plant breeders across Africa are going to be better at breeding the varieties that have the right traits but also have the, the traits that the consumers want. And that, that's very much about getting access to information and there's a huge uptake of mobile phones in Africa and they're being used for all sorts of purposes, you know, financial purposes, knowledge purposes, pests of disease identification, but getting access to market prices and knowing what's going on and knowing what the weather's going to be doing in the next couple of days is really critical for them when it comes to food production. And I think the other reason is um, the world's attention is now on this issue. For a whole stack of reasons, I think we're sort of at a turning point. We now recognise the link between food insecurity and conflict. We've got 22 million people in the Horn of Africa crawling around um, displaced um, and unfair um, as a result of famine and conflict in South Sudan and a whole lot of other things. Like that's a powder key potentially. We've signed up to the Sustainable Development Goals which means globally we're committed to ending hunger and ending inequality. We've signed up to a uh, Paris climate change commitment. So there's this big recognition of the problem and that we need to solve it by 2050 is the date that we've arbitrarily chosen. Um, and so I think that's why it's different now that there's a real emphasis on this from, the, from on the ground level right up to the you know, World Economic Forum, G20, World Bank Institution. Just to simply say that it's, it's not just about farmers and uh, the food that they produce, of course. It's about people who require food, and so uh, it's a less than perfect, but nevertheless, India has had a, and recently changed its policies in terms of providing food for the poor. And there's a program where they, you can, it's not just rural areas, it's an urban context as well. So you can provide food security uh, for low-income people. Uh, and that's another set of issues, quite separate from the food production side. I think that's part of what, what I think you were, you, you were talking to. And I think those are the sorts of things that we would have to think through. It's not just the supply issue, it's accessibility issue, it's about entitlements and how you can uh, respond to the needs of the poor. We are not just farmers. Okay, we've got 10 more minutes before the, oh no, Quentin, you said the, the time. So and we've got lots more questions. So we'll just get the question, put it to the panel, and move on. Okay. Yes, um, th thank you for very interesting talks. I, I guess I'm, uh, like many people, fascinated by this contradiction that we have people that are hungry, we potentially have two more billion people to feed, but things like uh, diabetes, uh, obesity are becoming ep epidemics in, in, developing, in the developed world and developing countries. So there's a real tension here. And I guess it sort of uh, raises the question about our attitude towards food production. And I think where I'm going with, uh, with uh, to with this is you know, the disconnection between food production 
and, and, and people. And I guess that uh, many figures were thrown around in terms of uh, we're going to have 9.5 uh, billion people, 70% of these people potentially going to be urbanized, agricultural lands are going to be moved further and further away from cities. So the, 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 the question is how do we sort of develop cities to sort of actually integrate agricultural production into the fabric of how cities work and how people relate to food production? I think part of it is the, the association between people and food. I was thinking about my grandparents and, and how they, they used to grow their own uh, fruit and vegetables at the home and it was a very important part of, of what they did. And I think more and more people in Australia are engaging with that closeness. But then there's also this idea about urban people producing food even if they live right in the middle of the city. And that's an intriguing concept where you might have a, a building that's uh, you know, 30 or 40 storeys high and then at each level people are growing plants. And as I mentioned before, that you can get up to 130 times uh, the amount of food if you're going up and not just down. So yes, I think people are starting to think about the association between uh, food and, and, and between people. I think it's a really good question. And one of the things we're looking to research is as economies develop, they tend to lose their traditional diets and eat foods that are really rich in fat and sugars, etc. And it's seen as a progressive thing to do. Um, but that, that's not always the case. And so it's interesting to see why some countries, I don't know if I should name names, go on one trajectory and, and eat very unhealthy, low dietary diversity foods, while others, like Vietnam, <laughs> Um, actually managed to develop really well but retain a lot of diversity. Now, we don't know the full range of reasons why that is, but a lot of it is to do with how the cities are designed, pre-urban agriculture, logistics of getting fresh food into the cities regularly. So that's sort of part of it, and a lot of it's culture and the way they feel about food. Um, it's interesting, I know in Melbourne, um, my daughter's very involved in this, there's this big sort of renaissance interest in food within the city and there's a lot of urban agriculture happening. And they have these um, pub evenings where all these you know, hipster young people <laughs> go to a pub and a pig farmer or a potato farmer will come and talk to them about the food. And, and in some cases, they've never even thought about where their bacon comes from. And these, these, two, these talks absolutely full house, and the farmer loves it, and they're just being fired with questions. So that's you know, one little way of how people try to reconnect with their food um, system in, in the urban environment. Thank you. Okay. Um, all what I have heard from the panelists, uh, they're all accurate and quite uh, informative information. But there's other side that often we don't talk about, which is the multilateral companies or corporation coming to Africa and buying all these lands. Saudis are coming to Sudan, and also you got the Chinese and others coming to Ethiopia, and we also the, all other um, uh, other plants that are considered to be quite essential for making all other products that we consume in the West, which is cocoa plant. The people of Cote d'Ivoire don't get that much from. Uh, the plant that produced that much we, we eat here in the West. Uh, so the equity uh, problem is another issue that needs to be addressed in order to encourage people uh, who are quite poor and yet they can't get the diet or the food that they, they want to eat so they can survive. I come from Gumbela area in Ethiopia and most of the land in Aroma land, which is the most fertile land, it's been sold out for the multilateral uh, corporations and the producing the food and it's shipped away to unknown part of the world. And the, even the local people aren't allowed to buy any food that's produced from their lands. And that's why we see uh, consistent or rather persistent unrest all the time. This is another issue that I haven't heard anything about in this conference, and I would love to hear what could be done uh, for the food that is, is produced in Africa, perhaps, to be shared or to be given a 25% of the food what is produced to be consumed locally. Thank you. Look, um, I mean, in terms of the proportion of land that's been acquired in Africa, it's a very small proportion, but that doesn't take away the fact that you've raised the point of Ethiopia in its particular places and those particular regions, that it is important. 
I mean, there are a number of policies, institutional ways that you could approach this. It's not really just a food problem, although we see it as a food problem. It's what's going on in those countries in terms of governance issues. And you know, so, you know, we've, we've got a policy, and it's, uh, I hate to sort of connect oranges and apples here, but, you know, we have a policy at the moment to make gas reservation in Australia. We talk about food reservation in the context of Africa. So if these, if this, if these lands are acquired by you know, whatever they may be, but to non-nationals, and um, the food is being exported, then there has to be a requirement that, that a proportion of that food or returns from that uh, are provided for the, the, the communities uh, around those locations, or indeed on a, on a national basis. Uh, and in terms of cocoa and Cote d'Ivoire, I mean, there again is the issue about you know, who's getting what. This is a value chain issue. It's a, it's a consistent story, not just in Africa, about who's getting what and who's getting the return for that. And now again, it's, it's in part a governance issue. I mean, part of it, it's about where the value add is being, is, is being attributed. And then also it's a question of the buying power. But, but certainly uh, the issue of uh, you know, taxation, you know, it's a, again, another issue that we can think about in Australia, but maybe not in the food context. Taxation is critically important to that, to make sure that there's adequate returns on a national basis. And that those returns, of course, go back to the people who, who, who need it. Um, uh, poor countries won't be able to provide transfer payments the way we do in Australia, but, but nevertheless, there needs to be adequate return. Otherwise, why, why have the activity in, in the first place? So I think it's not just a food issue. I think it's a bigger, bigger policy, governance, institutional failure type issue, which is not just an African story. Uh, we have that story in other places, including Australia. Did you, oh, I think we've got... Can yep. I just add something? I, yeah. I think there is something we can all do about the cocoa issue in particular, yeah. and that's stand up and use our consumer voice. Um, child labour in, in West Africa in the cocoa plantation is there because they're not paying sufficient wages for an adult to go to work every day. So if we understand what's going on and we only buy products that are certified and you know good bean to bar, then we're going to change what's happening there. And the cocoa industry, the global cocoa industry, is well aware of this and trying to do things about it. So it, it, it is a topic that, that could shift in time, but there is something that even us. Hi, uh, my name is Coast. I'm from the ANU. My question goes to food waste. Uh, I'd address it to Melissa and Andrew because they mentioned it in their talks. Um, so in the West or in the food secure countries, you've got methods of preservation. Refrigeration is common. You don't have that in Africa or in many of the food insecure countries. So what I'm pointing, what I'm trying to point out is we've got we've gone past a stage in food secure countries where. You, you're not losing food in that direction, you're losing, wasting food between the farm gates and when it gets to the farmers. But then we've just started demanding super high quality products and then going on to waste them. There was a figure of a third of what we produce gets wasted. Part of it is what we buy from the shops and don't consume. My question then is how are we addressing this issue in the West? Let's leave the African beat. We've answered that most of this talk. What happens in the West? How do you address the issue of waste in that which you manage to produce? I think one of the things we need to do is, is for, to change the perception uh, for consumers that it's okay to eat food uh, that is it's still highly nutritious. It just might look a bit funny. It mightn't be perfect. Uh, and there are pushes, I, I know, in countries like Denmark, in Copenhagen, for example, where they've got a, a group called We Food, and, and that's what it's about. It's about selling produce that's not perfect, but it's still fine, and people are becoming to come, uh, beginning to come on board with that a lot more. So I think we need to think very differently about it um, and send that, that message to the uh, the big supermarkets that we're, you know, we're happy to eat food that's nutritious and good. It might just, it might be perfect, but, but it's fine. So I think that's a step that we could take. And maybe they need to relabel the odd bunch to the brilliant bunch or, the, you know, it's, it's, it's a marketing thing too, isn't it? Beyond that, you know, they've sold yeah. that particular saving thing and as something that's weird, it's still weird. It's not yeah. weird, it shouldn't be weird. And it might be a, um, you know, instead of a use by date, it might be a freeze by date. Just a, you know, a different way of thinking about it. Well. Time for a couple more quick questions down the front here and up the back. So I'll have this one up the back and then. 
Just a quick question. I recently read a book by Steve Hallett called Life Without Oil, and he argued that uh, the basis for our economy and our ecology is that we use oil to produce everything. So we need oil to produce pesticides. We need oil to uh, to move products from paddock to plate. What happens in Africa where we clearly see the multinational companies taking out enormous amount of, amounts of oil? And also, too, on a deeper level, we're approaching peak oil, where we're going to move past the point where we're going to have the amount of oil needed to you know, modernise or move technologies further that will increase productivity in Africa. What can we do about that? Well, this is, this is connected to the, the food, energy, water story or the nexus issues. And, uh, certainly, uh, peak oil has been uh, an idea that's been around a long time. And, and if you take uh, unconventionals and add it onto conventional uh, uh, resources, uh, we may not have reached peak oil just yet, but approaching it. But the really thing, thing, is, the thing to think about is what are the substitutes? In the context of oil, um, I, I think there will probably be oil left in the ground at some point. There'll certainly be coal left in the ground. And, uh, and that's a function of what the uh, substitutes are. So um, in the context of transportation fuels, uh, there are biofuels, but they have a whole set of issues associated with them in the, in the context of the land they use and in terms of the water they use, but also in terms of the impact on prices because you're taking land away from food production. Uh, in the other context of uh, you, can, you can electrify various systems, you can electrify our transportation systems, for example, um, but if we do that, we have to look for sources of, uh, you know, climate change context and climate change mitigation, we'd look to look for, uh, you know, uh, renewables. In that context, uh, if you look at the uh, photovoltaics, um, they are, uh, you know, if you look at the prices, the uh, costs, I should say, after 2030, uh, they're going to be very competitive. They're looking at, I can give you some numbers, but they're, they're much cheaper than, uh, than you'd get uh, from, uh, from pretty much any fossil fuel uh, uh, electricity uh, generation. So I think this change is happening. I think it's happening but that is fast enough, but there's a whole range of things that's, that's already, I think, taking place right now in, in Australia. It will happen perhaps at a different pace and in a different way in Africa. Uh, but um, I think from, from the energy side, I'm, I'm much more confident on the energy side uh, than I am in, let's say, other contexts. Um, I think we have a really huge problem in agriculture. It's just to a low carbon agriculture by 2050. And um, ACR works quite closely with the CGIAR, which is a big international group of 15 research centres, and we're constantly opposing this challenge. They spend a billion dollars a year on, on agricultural research. There's 10,000 scientists, and it's sort of not in their horizon at the moment. And, and we've really got to start thinking about how we're going to do that, or we're just not going to meet our community. I might, I might get to the questions that are coming Just very briefly, a lot about how ownership of farm inputs helps farmers become a lot more productive. And you also talked a lot about water usage. So when you look at the Australian system, farmers have ownership of water through water allocations through the Murray-Darling Basin Authority. And um, that's water trading. So farmers can decide whether they grow crops or not, based on how much water they get allocated every year. Um, so my question right now is, um, farmers had massive yield Im improvements in Australia. For example, in cotton and rice farming in Australia, yields have gone through the roof per water used. Are there any thoughts about introducing that into the developing world? In terms of water markets? Um, look, I think water markets have done a great job for us in Australia, and particularly during the millennium drought. I am, however, hesitant to say, take what we've done in Australia and apply it universally. I won't mention particular countries, I don't know, but, but I can think of some countries where if you took the sort of structure, water structure markets that we have in Australia, just wouldn't work in those countries for a variety of reasons. So you have uh, gross inequities in terms of land tenure, gross inequities in terms of power relationships. So once you know sorts of relationships, you can't necessarily have competitive water markets. Uh, you may not have the capacity to have proper trading and transparency in prices. And what that might lead to is that uh, you might get concentration of water in the hands of a few. So um, I think that's a challenge in, in quite a number of countries. But certainly in some countries uh, that are not Australia, 
I think there is uh, real potential to, to have water markets provide greater levels of uh, efficiency in terms of conservation and use of, of water. Uh, and certainly when I think of some countries that are, uh, um, are profligate in terms of their use of water, again, I don't want to mention, I can think of a few right now, but I think water markets could be very helpful. Uh, and certainly there are some countries that are now thinking about how that might be done. I think we're really getting tight on time. If you're, we've gone five minutes over, is everybody happy to stay for five minutes more and then we'll... Yeah? yeah? The, <laughs> the project that ACR is supporting us to do in Africa was facing these very challenges that Quentin's raising. What we found was the farmers were super saturated in their fields. And when we gave them simple tools, uh, they started watering a third as often. And what we found was the real incentive for the farmers to save water wasn't money, it was uh, the labour saving. And that is really driving a lot of efficiency in these smallholder schemes. And can I just add, that particular project had an outcome that none of us had predicted, was that it reduced a lot of conflict in the community that was mm. happening about water usage. Mm. And so it really had an impact on the whole sort of cohesion as well. So it became a much nicer place. And just one, one example on that, the, the technology too with the, the water part. With rice, for example, if you can, traditionally it's grown under a flooded system, but if you can grow rice in an unflooded system, an aerobic system, studies done all over the world show that you can use about 30% less water, but you can get the same grain yield and quality. And those novel water saving strategies have been <coughs> tested in the, the Philippines and in India and uh, Indonesia and Vietnam, uh, and, and they can work very well. Mm. Two last questions, one here, Mark, back. Uh, Dennis Blight from the Crawford Fund. Um, when Sir John Crawford advised the government, I'm surprised no one's mentioned Sir John Crawford, by the way, given <laughs> our location. You're in your <laughs> uh, Sir John Crawford advised the government of India to adopt the new high yielding varieties of rice and wheat. And that's what gave real impetus to the Green Revolution. Sir John said in those days, this will give us breathing space to look at the population issue. Has anyone any evidence which shows that there are successful population control programs other than prosperity? First point. Uh, the second point, is there anything innately different about the continent of Africa that might suggest it will not see the same sort of success as we've seen in Southeast Asia and South Asia? My assumption and Bill Gates' assumption is there isn't and that we can also, we can do it in Africa. I'll briefly come to the second part of your question. Can we do it in Africa? Uh, I think it can be done in Africa, and I think it's a governance challenge. I think it's working with the national governments to change the rules to free up the farmers to do what's needed. And yeah, the right technologies to respond to the farmers and the farmers now. I think we can definitely do it in Africa. Um, I think there's, as you know, there's a huge amount of youth and entrepreneurial spirit in Africa. And that's going to be really critical for taking us to that next level of transformation. Does anyone want to address the first question, which I think is probably the elephant in the room? How many people can the look, planet um, sustain, and is, has there been a uh, look, reduction? Once you start talking, I won't say population control, I think it turns family planning or however you want to call it. Um, but you know, once it, it gets into some pretty, pretty sort of sets of issues that can cause a lot of, a lot of right. challenges. But, yes, there is. There, there is some evidence that some countries have adopted planning, planning approaches that seem to seem to help. But it's not just it's not just the case of family planning from a government initiative, but also there are other incentives. So in particular, you know, education of women and girls in particular, opportunities for women. Those are, as you said, you know, the economic transformation is, is critically important. But yes, you can I mean, if you want to talk about a particular example, China, of course, is one child policy. That's a non, that's a non, that's a non democratic <laughs> approach uh, to, to dealing with it. But, but there are, you know, there are democracies uh, that, that, that have adopted family planning approaches. Bangladesh has done certain things as well, that has in contrast to some other, you know, its neighbor uh, that I think have been successful. 
So on yes. that point, it's interesting. Do do you think I put this to someone? The the idea that if you pull people out of poverty, less labour, as you said, they have to water their crops as often. Kids can go to school, they get an education. That they're not necessarily planning family planning education, which is a general education, and that then. Um, reduces the population. Is there evidence of that? Yeah. I, I think what you're talking yes. about is building resilience yes. in families, yeah. and children are an insurance policy for a lot of families. But when you have other resources like education um, and, and other types of employment, then, then you're building resilience through those alternative means. In your example. Okay. Just, just that moment. Opportunities for women is the key for this. Okay, economic opportunities for women is the key to dealing with this with this issue. Uh, so you can have economic growth, but you don't have the opportunities for women. You're not going to get the the, the sort of uh, population uh, increases, reductions that you'd be looking for. So it, it has to be thought through in a careful way. And perhaps some of that up explanation might go to why it succeeded in some countries and perhaps not in others. Thank you. Last question for the evening. Oh, no pressure. Um, <laughs> perhaps this is a question for John. Um, we've talked about uh, securing the food systems for the developing uh, world, but I wonder if we could bring it back to our own backyard and ask a comment about how we can be securing our own food systems and also not just securing them but improving them and what the big ticket items are to achieving that. Well, thanks for that question. I think um, obviously to continue to breed uh, successfully and, and get yield increases requires a large investment of money. And different countries have adopted different ways of actually raising that revenue. And I, I particularly like the contrast between the US approach and the European approach. So in the US, a uh, litigious society will, will sue farmers if they grow seed from safe seed rather than buy fresh seed and pay the royalty to the seed company. In Europe, the farmers uh, voluntarily declare that they're saving seed and resowing it and pay a premium uh, that's smaller than the original price, but back to the seed company uh, for the privilege of reusing that seed, because they recognise that, that, that is, there is a cost in actually producing this seed and continuing to, to provide new varieties. So there are different different ways that that, that uh, the, the breeding can be financed, um, but the bottom line is that you need to invest large amounts of money uh, to continually improve varieties to cope with uh, disease um, and pest. Uh, and also to just to raise the yield. And that money's got to come from somewhere. Well, I think that might wrap us up for this, this evening. Thank you all so much for coming out and contributing so much to this discussion, but thank you all to our five wonderful panellists. Now, we can probably all go home and have a nice plant-based dinner <laughs> for the rest of the week, maybe a little bit of meat on a Monday, locusts maybe even, suggested. Thank you to the Crawford School and uh, for hosting us here tonight.